Hello and welcome to Café Philosophy, the program dedicated to the discussion of great philosophical ideas and problems. I'm Dr. Michael Picard, and our topic this show is the relation of self to other. Who am I? How did I become who I am? How essential to my inner being are other people? In this program, we'll be talking about the quizzical view that self and other, even though they are opposites, are in certain respects only definable through each other. The idea is that we have a social nature, a collective essence, as much as an individual one. To discuss this seemingly paradoxical concept, I had a conversation with Dr. Gira Bhatt, an instructor of psychology at Camosun College. A Canadian born and raised in Bombay, India, she took a master's in clinical psychology there and then went on to another master's and a PhD at Simon Fraser University in personality and social psychology. She has broad interests in psychology, ranging from social psychology to the history and theory of psychology to child psychology and methodology. Plus, as you will hear, she has keen interests and insights into philosophy and what we may call spiritual psychology, such as yoga. So join us for another session of Café Philosophy. We tend to take an insular view of the self, to think that our inner being is insulated and isolated from other creatures, in effect that each individual is an island and yet we exist in a sea of social relations. A common view is that whatever deep influences our culture may have in shaping our identity, that identity itself is somehow fixed for all time, from our origin to our demise, perhaps beyond that as well. On this view, while social realities may modify or alter our self, they do not create it and they cannot constitute it. A is A, the law of identity proclaims, meaning that each thing is what it is and not another thing, meaning that each thing has its existence by itself without the aid of any essential relations to other things, meaning that our ultimate identity is never encroached upon by others and that its boundaries are never trespassed by what is other, by what is not A. We may express this metaphysical view of the self as the idea that we ourselves, who and what we are, have impenetrable barriers, distinct boundaries surround our being, and that within this inner realm, we rule sovereign. We are monarch. On the same view, my style, my tastes, my likes and dislikes, my thoughts and opinions, all that regards my inner life, I choose by free will, just as I see fit. And yet, our entire lives, we are never outside social reality. There is no escaping the external determination of much of the conditions of our lives, conditions which condition us and who we are. For example, our entire lives we are rarely alone. Even when we are alone, it is social situations we think about and other people we relate to even in their absence. Or we watch television and get at least a semblance of relationship and a substitute for social life. Infants have an absolute dependency on their caregivers. Even older children need love and attention to develop in a healthy way. And not only the old and the infirm may live in dread of actual isolation, of finally being alone in the world. As adults, while we may prize our moments of solitude, practical realities typically demand interaction with others, whether it's work or play, buying or selling, or even crime, raising a family or falling in love. As they say, it takes two to tango, and nobody but nobody chooses their own parents. So all our lives, social realities impinge on us and stamp our lives with the deepest impress. Social relations help to inscribe our identity, partially write our individual histories, add character to our voices, and provide us with the world in which we act and identify. So how much of our life is up to us? subject to our own say, and willed as such by ourselves. This is where I began my philosophical conversation with Dr. Bhatt. I think it is a myth to believe that you are very much your own person. If you 
look at yourself and uh, try to understand what kind of a person you are, what are your thoughts, what your value systems are, the way you dress, the way you look. And um, it's uh, very tempting to conclude, this is what I chose to be. But if we dig a little deeper and uh, we try to analyze as to which part of this was really my own doing, and we realize the tremendous impact that other people directly or indirectly may have had on each and every facet of ourselves. And uh, so if we go very all the way to the beginning of it all, that uh, what is self, and you say, all you need to do is ask individual, tell us about yourself, and everything that individual will start saying that I'm such and such a person, I'm, I like this and I don't like this, and where do these ideas come from? How these ideas got shaped? Certainly we were not born with these ideas. And uh, to bring back Aristotle's notion of tabula rasa, when we are born, we are not born with these ideas. So where did these ideas come from? Mm -hmm. The tabula rasa being the the blank slate of the mind. The blank slate, exactly. And then uh, it seems that lots got written on it, and it wasn't your own writing. There's lots of it was because what others told you, and um, you told them something in in response to that, and those kind of dialogues that emerged. And as a result, as an adult, when you are asked what kind of a person you are, it's this accumulation of all these... uh, uh, information that you have. And all these other voices. So yes. It's as if we've incorporated these others into our mm-hmm. into our self in some way, into our identity? Certainly, certainly. From a social psychological perspective, we give a lot of uh, importance to how other people shape as to who we are, what we do, and what we are going to do. We cannot discount the tremendous impact that other people have on uh, not only just our lives, but uh, on how we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's it's not totally individualistic. And the basic question about self is who we are, and and Mm -hmm. you're saying that who we are is Mm -hmm. very much informed not just by our relations with others, but how Mm -hmm. we take in their voices Mm -hmm. into ourselves. One way to look at this is to uh, examine the fact that we never function alone. There are always other people, whether in actual physical sense or even in our thoughts. I mean, people are there, especially children, the way uh, human biological uh, system works, that we are dependent on caregivers and human beings as species have the longest childhood, meaning it's a very dependent uh, uh, phase in our life and we are dependent on our caregivers and other people. But uh, it depends a lot on what we are being told as to what kind of... uh, of an individual we are. So the child may be told, oh, you're just wonderful, you're just such a good little boy, or you're just so cute, you're so bright, or you're so dumb, you can't do anything. So all these messages are being received by the child, and uh, the child, if consistently receives one particular form of message, that becomes a part of one's uh, uh, self-information package, and uh, that forms that kind of uh, identity for the child. The incorporation of the voices of others into our self marks the rise of the social self. We internalize or appropriate the voices of others and enter as if into conversation within ourselves. This is how we come to see ourself, to have a sense of self, and to develop our self-feeling. This social psychological view was developed in part by American psychologist George Herbert Mead, who introduced as a technical term the notion of significant other. This refers not only to that special someone in our lives, but to all individuals who take pride of place in our world. Thus, the mother or primary caregiver of a child is the original significant other, and at first the infant sees itself almost wholly in relation to that other. Later, siblings and friends take on important degrees of significance. Eventually, we succeed in incorporating not just individual others, but a generalized other, over against which we finally have a general identity, a sense of sameness across all our various relations. We develop a relative autonomy and independence. Now, this process is not wholly one way. It is not that our external world determines in a unilateral fashion our inner being. Rather, we act back on the world and change and shape, in turn, the others within it, in whatever ways we can. The process of becoming, 
our sense of being is a two-way street, a reciprocal exchange. In a word, it is dialectical, which implies development through a dynamic opposition between opposites, here self and other. Another social psychologist in the tradition of Mead, Charles Cooley, called this view the looking glass theory of the self. He says that each to each is like a looking glass and uh, other people act like mirrors because we can't see ourselves directly so we look at other people, they act like mirrors. And the reflections that we see in them, that is the feedback we receive from them, we believe that's us, especially in the case of children, that is very true, that they, that is how they come to believe something about mm -hmm. themselves. I can really see it in the case of children. I was thinking as you were speaking of uh, the whole role of adolescence and mm -hmm. how uh, what the, their peer group starts to become uh, more important or at least as important as the family group and, and mm -hmm. what those other people think mm -hmm. of them right. is, uh, is such a crucial issue. That's just the right. dreadful agony of adolescence. Yes, <laughs> yes, because it's not just one mirror of your parents or caregivers, but as you grow up, there are more and more mirrors around you. And during adolescence, your friends become your mirrors for you. Mm -hmm. and, and the more uh, you get out in the world, you have more and more mirrors that you encounter, and they keep uh, giving you some feedback about yourself. That's interesting because, like, on one hand, you think of a mirror, mm -hmm. and and uh, most mirrors are more or less alike. You look into them, you get kind of the same mm -hmm. uh, image. But if you go to the circus um, mm -hmm. the, or the circus of life, the mm -hmm. mirrors are, are distorted and changed, and no mirror reflects mm -hmm. you in the same way. And I guess right. people are, as mirrors, are more like these circus mirrors. With, yes. With, uh, <laughs> With, and you see different aspects of yourself, sometimes with tremendous right. distortions. Yes, indeed, and that may explain why uh, people are not very accurate in their self-perceptions, uh, whether it's their body image, whether uh, it's their psychological image of who they are or what kind of people they are. Uh, they are not always very accurate. And I mean, if we can extend this metaphor even further, that if that is the case, then why people make errors? in judgments about themselves, that they do not always have a very, a very accurate image of themselves. And uh, one of the reasons, I mean, we can analyze it from these uh, different viewpoints. One thing, the mirrors don't always mi tell us exactly what we look like. I mean, mirrors as people don't tell us correct uh, image, what the correct image is like. Secondly, even if they try to tell us, these other people tell us that, um, you know, that's smart. I mean, they're trying to tell you something, but often we don't listen to that. We don't uh, believe that we kind of wear blindfolds, selective blindfolds, and we don't listen to that. Even if we listen to that, we may not interpret it correctly. Uh, I guess you're saying that there's a question of the, the truthfulness of the mirror in the first place, but then mm -hmm. it's how much we can listen to that and hear that, mm -hmm. hear what is actually being said. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe so that we can evaluate it and determine how much of it is true. Mm -hmm. But there's this other aspect that if we think of all all the others in the world as so many different mirrors that mm -hmm. we can find some reflection of ourself in, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, some people might find others a lot more interesting if they can find themselves <laughs> in others. <laughs> That's one thing. But, right. but more more significantly, there's a it introduces an element of choice. Right. We, if if we are a product of the images we see and perceive mm -hmm. in the mirrors of others, mm -hmm. and we are always meeting other people, then mm -hmm. we can sort of choose our mirrors, mm -hmm. and 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 so we are choosing to define ourselves mm -hmm. through relations with right. others. That is another myth to say that we pick and choose. We don't always get to do it. Um, we are not consciously picking uh, people around us. I mean, there are a lot of uh, feedback that we receive we never even asked for. And you may choose not to uh, uh, accept those feedback, but if repeatedly you hear that, you can't help but being affected by it. But let me just uh, uh, Look at it just besides the mirror part uh, where the individuals act as mirrors for you, other individuals in your life act as mirrors for you. But we also attach labels on those mirrors that uh, significant people in our lives, those mirrors are more believable. So we are more likely to believe messages that come from significant others. So if someone on the street yells at you and say, hey, you idiot, we may just continue to move on, smile, and not even notice that. But if your spouse tells you, I think, 
I have made a mistake in being relationship with you. You're an idiot. <laughs> 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 I mean, that would have a very strong impact because that mirror has more value for us. But also, if you yeah, take I know that one from experience. <laughs> I'm sure we all have. <laughs> and uh, the larger social context. I mean, forget the individual mirrors, but uh, the larger social cultural mirror. Like uh, from my experience of uh, transition from one culture to another, um, where the whole society collectively shapes who you are. I mean, that influence is very powerful. For example, uh, in the Western culture, when people are asked, tell us about yourself, they're more likely to use very individualistic description. We'll say, oh, I'm sensitive, um, I like cafe philosophy, I enjoy my mocha, and I like this, I like these people. It's very individualistic. Whereas in the traditional Eastern cultures, uh, if you go to a rural area, for example, and, and start a conversation and you ask the person, so uh, who are you? Or tell me something about yourself. You invariably find that people will say, I'm the uncle of such and such, I'm the son of such and such, or I'm a daughter of such and such, my grandparents are such and such, meaning they define themselves in relational terms, right? You don't draw very strict boundaries between yourself and other people. Maybe that's where my bias is coming from, where I'm saying, Michael, it's a myth to believe that <laughs> you know, you're your own person there. But, uh, and that influence is so powerful that unless you move from that setting to another, that often you're not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same would apply to individuals growing up in a certain other cultural context from the Western culture. When you move to the other culture, you realize that, oh my goodness, this is what I thought about myself, but mm, now this is a new view about myself. Mm -hmm. So the total cultural context also has a tremendous impact on uh, how you view yourself mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a higher level mirror um, mm -hmm. I was thinking of uh, also as you're speaking of the idea of family in particular mm -hmm. uh, as uh, a gray area between self and other mm -hmm. or uh, it's not it, it doesn't it itself shows that uh, we can't think of ourselves as being mm -hmm. surrounded by some impermeable barrier mm -hmm. uh, with mere impressions coming in. Yes. It's, it's, uh, our families are a group of others which have a special meaning to us and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and both our family of origin and the families that we mm -hmm. create and develop as we uh, grow Certainly, older. right. So it's not just a constant uh, reception of feedback from others, but we also in turn say something in return to the mirrors. Mm -hmm. These mirrors in turn say something back to us. So the dialogue certainly continues. So th it's a dialectical uh, product, I would say, mm -hmm. th the way we visualize ourselves. And uh, we like to believe, as I again want to emphasize, that uh, I have this haircut because I decided, looked at the magazine, and I said I needed a change, and I made this decision. But we just have to dig a little deeper and say, so to what extent uh, your desire to change was prompted? Mm -hmm. And very often you'll find other people lurking in mm -hmm. your analysis uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's where it came from. I've thought of things like that in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of just uh, your food. Mm -hmm. You know, think of where your food came from and, and who, mm -hmm. who put the work into that, mm -hmm. from the people who wrapped it at the stores to the producers mm -hmm. on the ground to mm -hmm. the people who who drive transport to uh, mm -hmm. get from one place to the other and mm -hmm. and even something as simple as a meal may have foods from all parts of the world mm -hmm. and so the uh, mm -hmm. those other people have in some sense contributed to mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. your meal you may um, uh, right. and so we're caught in this web of uh, mm -hmm. especially other people's labors w which mm -hmm. so much determines the, the world in which we live, from mm -hmm. our food to our schools, the buildings, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the rest of our surroundings. Right. That's interesting when you talk about food. Uh, I'm interested in the research uh, pertaining to cross-cultural issues, too. And uh, I came across this research that when people move from one culture to another, they have to make a lot of changes because now the mirrors have changed, the social context has changed completely. So that, in turn, will change some of the ideas about themselves too and um, some of the cultural baggage must go and some new ones must be adapted and I was reading in this that uh, 
the immigrants when they arrive uh, in a different country and first generation will hold on to a lot of cultural baggage and some of this will gradually go and second and third generation like language goes and uh, you know some of the value system changes but uh, what is your guess which is the last component to go well, since we set it up, I'm going to guess food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. But, <laughs> but, but I don't think I would have guessed that independently. Yes, uh, yes. Food preferences are last to go. So it would be third, fourth generation immigrant uh, from a different culture may have changed outwardly and even internally in value system and everything. But when it comes to food preferences, the person may still enjoy traditional uh, one's own uh, original culture meal. It's amazing that moral values and family values <laughs> should be more ephemeral <laughs> than <laughs> taste than right, <than> yes. food. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking about food because like food is this incorporation of something which is other and right. it's partly other people's labor mm -hmm. but it's also just something which isn't you and becomes you in the process of eating mm -hmm. and there's, there's somehow a metaphor in that for what we've just been talking about, how mm -hmm. we are shaped by our, mm -hmm. as it were, consumption of others in mm -hmm. our interactions with them. But what I'm thinking about now is like uh, um, the notion uh, of self mm -hmm. and who we are. Some, for some people, has a kind of eternal ring. You know, it's like who we are, our, our individual spirit or identity is precedes our culture, precedes even our families. We were, mm -hmm. you know, the soul put into the body at birth. It's a, it's a view that a mm -hmm. lot of people have, have an idea of. And somehow if that's us, presumably that has at least in, mm -hmm. in uh, germ form all the characteristics that we will mm -hmm. later develop, uh, de mm -hmm. develop as persons. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that our characteristics as persons, as, as selves, mm -hmm. it comes more from our relations to other people and, and is uh, constructed by our relations with other mm -hmm. people, what is left to this more metaphysical notion yeah. of self? Do you, is it a notion you reject or are, <laughs> and I know that this is not a, like yeah. a, a psychological question, <laughs> we're moving into the, into uh, the speculative. I'll try, I'll try. Uh, I'm not completely discounting uh, this idea that maybe there is something deeper or beyond whatever you wish to call it. Uh, what I've talked about so far is more concrete aspect of ourselves in our day-to-day -day life or uh, if you just want to understand the concrete aspect of self. But my favorite philosopher has to be William James and uh, he was the one who we psychologists uh, absolutely admire but he himself rejected towards later in his life as you know that he didn't want to be called a psychologist <laughs> he preferred to be called a philosopher and uh, he was the one who uh, made a very nice distinction between i and me me is what i have talked about so far so far that this is me this is me this is me where we talk about relational uh, um, aspects uh, in shaping ourselves but Despite all the changes that we go through, like even feedback that we received and then our ideas are shaped, but we don't have one idea that we stick to, right? I mean, these ideas go through lots of changes. So 10 years ago, what we believed ourselves to be, and now what we are is a G, I was a very different person, right? I mean, we go through lots of changes. And so we go through a lot of physical changes. We don't look the same we looked um, 10 years ago. Uh, so everything has changed about our physical self and a lot has changed about our psychological self too. We have matured. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but Speak for yourself. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. My, um, uh, uh, so I get this idea of the, the me as more mm -hmm. about our uh, relational self, which changes. As well as our physical. And our, our physical self, yeah. Self, and and yeah. that has changed. And that does change over time. Yeah. So you but say this is my body. That's me. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. But there, it, but there has to be a continuity. If if mm -hmm. me when I'm six is very different than mm -hmm. me when I'm thirty or forty or fifty, mm -hmm. uh, it's still mm -hmm. it's still me. I want to say like yes. I that was me that boy <laughs> back then. That was me. And right. so somehow there there has to be an I to right. connect them. And I, is is that the distinction between I and me? Like there's yes, I think you you explained it uh, way better than I did. <laughs> 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 I like metaphors better, so I'll use another metaphor that uh, as a philosopher you must be aware of is is this metaphor of a ship. 
that the ship is constructed, over time some parts wear out, so you replace those. Other parts wear out, you replace those, those parts. And then over time, let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you look at the ship, none of the original parts are there. Let's say each and every part of the ship has been changed. Is it still the same ship? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, can we call it the same ship? So this is what we call self-sameness or self-identity issues. And that's what William James was saying, that uh, there is this constant um, I, which is kind of standing like a center of all the changing me's in the midst of it all. It just stands, uh, enduring. And it's there. And uh, that's what perhaps explains uh, the sense of sameness that we have. Yes, I was like that, and I was uh, different then, but now I'm changed, but it is still me. Mm -hmm, and yeah. that, that's what allows us. Uh, so I do believe that there is this sense of I, but then we have to uh, move a little further and say, what is that sense of I? Ah, that eternal question. What is this sense of I? We reach here the more mysterious and profound ground of philosophy and religion of spirituality and meditative practice. If our relational and physical self is the domain of everyday reality, the more enduring sense of self-sameness, the continuity of the witness throughout our days, takes us to loftier ground and raises questions no empirical psychology can answer. And perhaps no philosophy either, insofar as philosophy must employ reason. For in ultimate matters like self and identity, Words and even poetry readily fail us, and we must resort to immediate experience. But in an effort to ponder these imponderables, my guest came to reflect on certain meditative practices and techniques known to her, and which seem to bear on the status, real or illusory, of this self-same self. She recollected some experiences with yoga philosophy and how it has come to influence her current research interests in professional psychology. It just reminds me of this yogic meditation exercise that uh, I used to do back in India. And um, one of the major meditation techniques was to uh, sit and um, pretend that you're watching a movie. So you close your eyes and then uh, let your thoughts pass as if these thoughts and events and images that you have, they're being projected and, uh, and you're just watching them, right? And so the idea was to separate your sense of I, which is the spectator, and the me's, which are moving your thoughts and images. So the idea is to separate the two. And it's a great experience. Uh, I do not know how psychologically we can ever tap into these uh, experiences in, in a lab setting, for example. But uh, uh, we have this uh, sense of constancy, for sure. And perhaps as human beings, it's essential for our existence and for our sanity. In fact, the, f the moment we lose that sense of I, and that's where we say, hmm, you're going crazy. Mm -hmm. It gets fragmented. My background in psychology would allow me to go only this far. But we have to account for people's experiences of uh, this I that they have. And so I'm also moving into the field of history and philosophy. And um, it's... Uh, it's an interest that I've developed in the last six, seven years. And some of my friends say it's a sign of age when you like history. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but you have to allow for that because then only you can make a claim that you're trying to understand human beings in totality. You can discount those experiences. So I, I do believe that we need to examine this very carefully. And especially, as I say, coming from India, we have a very rich tradition of focusing on the sense of I and there is actually an active attempt to break this sense of I, that you completely fragment it and then build it again. And um, that's the exercise that's being promoted. But when you do it actively, consciously, then it's yogic meditation. But if you, it happens to you just uh, without your control, you are a schizophrenic. So here, my friends, on this note of madness and mystery, we must end. Alas, time is short. It is perhaps appropriate that our conversation, having just raised the unutterable riddle of self and consciousness, should break off here, as if to highlight the answerless question of the ultimate reality of self. If we can conclude anything, it is that even our eternal sense of I is subject to doubt and uncertainty. That I may think and yet not be, ultimately. Perhaps we do well to question and test our outer limits, the movable and the permeable boundaries of ourself, 
and to probe and poke ourselves within so as to goad us on to greater self-knowledge. And what might better cap off a knowledge of self than a sense of selflessness? With this paradox, we end another session of Cafe Philosophy. Thank you.